are live, but we're also on tape. We are in the bowels of Lee's music. That's Chris Folds. I'm Marty Hastings. Chris, uh, you look better than ever. Thank you, you look better than ever. <laughs> Where'd you get that vest? Uh, my wife, and the shirt, and the jeans, and the shoes. Yep. You come back from suspension too? You're I am, I'm back after being suspended for being tardy. Uh, Chris the Tardy Bear is here and uh, ready to go. Jessica did a great job in my stead. I watched the show when I was uh, away and uh, it was good. You were actually on vacation. What were you up to? Just had to take a week off. We had to burn a lot of time off at the newspaper. We tend to accumulate holidays because it's a very busy place to work. So I just took a week off and I uh, hung out with my dog, went to Vancouver for a couple of days read a lot, uh, and also worked a bit. Catherine, do any shopping down there? Yeah, the, she did some shopping and yeah. she- uh, Too she much bought, shopping? She, yeah, or? she bought some shoes and she <laughs> bought uh, some nice uh, some nice pants, yep. Cool, okay, <laughs> glad we know that. Yeah. Um, it's a stack show, every week it seems like the shows get more stacked. We have a great guest today. Uh, you wanna introduce him real quick right now? Yeah, we have Craig Thompson from the, uh, from the Royal Canadian Legion locally, past president and uh, spokesman, and he's the go-to guy for all things veterans, legion, and stuff like that, and he'll be talking today about uh, this week's Remembrance Day ceremony. Again, it's, it's diluted, but uh, we do have more this year than last year. We'll also be talking a little bit about uh, Veterans Affairs. Our, our local MP was just named critic for Veterans Affairs, so we can get into that a bit too. Okay, cool. We also have Matthew Seminoff of the Kamloops Blazers, the red piping hot Kamloops Blazers, seven wins in a row there. One loss. One loss, top of the BC division. He's gonna join us uh, live on tape and last week, this week. Also, I went to uh, visit the TRU Wolfpack volleyball teams. It was kind of cool to see everybody. I hadn't been in the gym in a while and saw some old faces. We're gonna catch up with them, bring you into practice and catch up with them. You mentioned Chris the Tardy Bear here. Um, you saw him last week, take a bit of an injury, he fell down, but it's all for a good cause. The Holiday Bear, Chris the Tardy Bear, we're giving away two dozen of these right here. Grand prizes such as a getaway to Sun Peaks, $1,000 in Safeway GCs, you can check our paper out. Starting November 24th, you can check our paper out, uh, Kamloops, this week, and you can find out how to uh, get them. And this is one of the great photos. I think Dave Eagles took this photo. That's Steve Giddis. At the time, he was probably... Uh, he was in his hundreds. Uh, about 100 right then, yeah. 101. And you did a story on him about just the longevity and the fact that at that age, he was still uh, lawn bowling. He was curling. He was going. He went on a cruise around the world. Cruise <laughs> with his wife after this. Yeah. His last cruise. He was 101 years old. Look how dapper. Look how look how dapper he looks. He yeah. actually um, retired from the Canadian Armed Forces as a major as well. He was born February 17, 1910. Died April 2016. Yeah. Um, do you remember the bungle job that we did in the paper for the article that I wrote? Vaguely. The birthday? Yeah, the birthday. So yeah. I had recorded his birthday wrong as February 14th, Valentine's right. Day. Right, right. <laughs> and you read, you read the article and decided to go big, like this big poster front of like rock of love, Valentine's yes. Day, yeah. turns 100, yeah. going to the Guinness Book of World Records. Based on what you filed and based on what he told you, or so we thought. Born February 17th. That's right. So yeah. one of the great embarrassments that I've ever had in the business. Business. Anyway, yes. however, uh, also on that note, Giddis also, Mr. Giddis, was um, from your article, uh, he, he got into the Guinness Book of World Records because he, uh, someone submitted it, he's the oldest active, active curler. living curler. And in that book that came out, that big book you find at Chapters Everywhere, there's a big picture, and the picture we took, and a little bit of your story. In, the, in that book, it's pretty amazing. He's obviously no longer holding that title as he's, as he's deceased. But the, I bring this up um, because I want to talk about interviews. Um, <laughs> the interview that I'm going to play is not classy, it's lowbrow, um, but I do want to ask you about your favorite interviews or zany interviews. Is there something that sticks out in your mind? Yeah, the, well, the one thing, uh, there's been so many, I mean, through the years, I've been in the business too long, 29 years, but um, uh, uh, one of the most memorable things was the 1996 provincial general election. I was in Abbotsford covering it. It was a beautiful May, May, uh, sunny May. The election was on May 28th, and uh, we had a candidate named Bruce Temple for the NDP running against John Van Dongen of the Liberals. Now, in Abbotsford, it's so conservative. If you're a liberal, so cred, conservative down there, you can be a rutabaga with a, with a pen and you'll win because they always win. So, <laughs> so the NDP running there was a sort of article of faith. They were just running to keep the name up. Anyway, one day I went downtown. It was a Saturday. I had filed a story the day before about the debate. I thought it was a very fair and nice story. I was downtown, beautiful day. People are out. I thought I could walk into the NDP office, just say hi, maybe do an interview. Uh, Right when I walked in, they started yelling at me. And the campaign manager was very, very, he was very intense. And they didn't like something in the article I wrote. Mm -hmm. I thought it was fair anyway. And I was saying, well, I think it was an okay article. And right then, 
he picked up a flower pot and he threw it right at me. <laughs> what? And I went, <laughs> who, who, and threw, it smashed who threw it? The campaign manager. Oh. And then Bruce Temple comes out of the back and he's this tall guy and he usually is very genial <laughs> and he starts yelling at me and I'm thinking, what did I write? So I just sort of backed out of the, the, the building and I walked over to my car and I'm kind of rattled. Went down to the office and grabbed the paper again. This is pre-internet days and I'm, I'm reading the story and it was fine, but they were so amped the slightest thing in there i think maybe they had 10 less 10 fewer words than the next candidate because there was five candidates running yeah. on that on that stage it was a very strange strange it's time. amazing the word counting that happens sometimes that happened actually a while ago with the blazers and greg Trinan, but um that's that's for another day i i'm gonna play this interview in a second before i do let's talk about the broncos camels broncos for a second i'm gonna build them up and tear them down and build them up again yep so they won a game and it was great. The players have worked their asses off, the coaching staff, the management, um, the brass. They've, they've worked hard to, to get this win. But the bottom line is, I don't know how much patience the city and the community has left for the team. You can't lose 27 games in a row. You can't continually have your bungle jobs off the field, which they had again they this, did. this year. They did, yes. They handled it terribly mm -hmm. with the media. They bungled it with the media, and they deserve to be called out. I just don't know how much patience the city has left for them now. Now, on that, on that note, we're talking about the brass. We're not talking about the players. No, obviously, I think, I know I want the franchise to succeed. I want. I don't care who's running it, but it has to stop. It's like every single year there's something new that comes up. The excuses have to be done. I know they're in tough with recruiting. They always are going to be in tough com competing well, against Nanaimo Kelowna. And, and Kelowna and Langley, yep. But zero wins is unacceptable. I, Braden Van Conant, I'm a Braden Van Conant guy. I think he got kind of wrapped in with a bunch of BS that was happening behind the scenes. Behind anyway, the scenes, yeah. that's, my, that's my rant. I, I think a lot of people are going to agree with me that the, this has to change next year. You can't have your off-field jokes happening anymore. You have to start winning some games. you got to be a professional. Yeah, and, and look, some of it's not their fault. Nope. They, the pandemic screwed them over. Wildfires caused some, uh, some, some games to be cancelled two years ago. Last year there was, no, there was no season. Yeah, they have some extenuating circumstances, but a lot of the stuff you're talking about is self-inflicted. Yeah, and they have worked hard, so that's it for the rip job. I hope things turn around. There's silver lining in, 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 in the fact, and I was mentioning it to Mike and Bonnie, um, you know, the genesis of the interview. Right, so I went to their final game of the season, and I wasn't sure what to expect. They had to win this game, okay? They can't go three seasons in a row losing every single game. They hadn't won a game in four, four years. calendar years. That's right. And who wants to come back and play for that team? They had built their season around this. They had to win last game of the season against the bottom feeder team, the West Shore Rebels. Who had a win coming in. Who had a win coming in. So they get it done. And after the game, it's like they won the Super Bowl, the Great yeah. Cup. You name it. It was unbelievable. And it was actually cool. It was moving. I thought at first, I'm like, that's kind of embarrassing that celebrating one win. But it meant so much to you them. You think about the, the, the road they've traveled, right? Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I just happened to notice. Well, this guy was their best player, in my opinion, Cam Grzorsik. And I just noticed this guy was amped. So I went over and talked to him. And uh, this is what the interview sounded like right here. Please be advised, the following interview contains foul language. What did that mean to the guys to get, to get the win? Oh tonight? my, so much. It meant so fucking much. I know I'm just getting on the team, but there's a lot of vets here. And this was just, this was the break. This is the breaking point. We fucking went there. We went everything out we wanted on the field. We put everything we had on that field. We worked together. We made, I think, the best, one of the best games we've ever played. And fuck, we're just, we're so happy. We're so happy. We broke that losing streak. How much was on the line for you guys? I mean, you had to win this game at home. We had to. We're at home. It's Halloween! No, it's a good night. It's that last game of the season. It's some of the last games some of these boys are going to play. And some of them, like, you know, they're not coming back. It's just, it was, we had to do it. We had to win and, if you know, everything on the line. Level with me. How, how challenging has this season been, man? To, to, to just go every game and, and, and not win and, and to be to be over. How challenging has it been this season? Uh, it's been pretty hard, especially on morale, on the boys. You know what, in the end, it worked out for us. We fucking won, we got together, and we just had that chemistry today. Okay, thanks a lot. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, thanks, man. Alex! Alex! Jordan! Come here! Do you remember what my dad said at the Webster's about egregious language? Yes, yes. We went to the Webster's when Marty was up for an award, and, and, and Marty's dad, who is an esteemed author, uh, massive uh, brain at uh, Regent College at UBC, he liked this. He liked the um, the whole ceremony, but he didn't like the gratuitous use of profanity by the two hosts. And I said to him the next day when we were having a beer at a pub that uh, profanity is the counterfeit currency of a bankrupt vocabulary. <laughs> and that's true. Um, on, on, on this note, though, 
it's a little different when it becomes, it, it, it's, it's not stage, it's it's pure emotion. There's no filter when you're so excited. And when you're a younger guy, yeah. when I was younger, I would I would probably swear more than I do now. Yeah. And I, so I give him a pass on that because it's honest and it's and it's and it's and it's and it's not meant to be cool or or crass. It's it, that, that's how he expresses his 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 energy. So you can see the the uh, the actual um, just the the passion there. Yeah, I just think it captured it captured the feeling, and it was just a raw a raw moment. Normally, it's different. Football guys are different than your kind of polished WHLer who is going to be very by the book, and they're worried. And they're about probably coached, media coach, yeah. whereas these guys wouldn't be to that extent, if at all. No. Yeah. No. Any other thoughts on interviews before we move on to an actual interview, a classier interview than, than that one? <laughs> well, the only thing is, is uh, there's a there's a reporter who became a uh, national reporter. He's from my hometown of Abbotsford, John Sawatsky, and then he worked with the Conservative government. And then ESPN hired him away, and his to his entire job, I'm not sure if he's still there, is to teach reporters how to interview properly. So when you see an interview, whether it's on TV or in the newspaper, uh, you'll know an interview is good based on the questions that people ask, and the and the and the greatest sin a reporter will can do is to give 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 the person an out a yes or no question yeah. you, you leave it open and you let them talk and another thing is when you're doing an interview ask the question and shut up yeah and if there's silence and if you do a hard interview where it's, where, where it's you know political or, or a controversial sports interview and there's some really uncomfortable questions and, and you're trying to be you know nice but you want answers just shut up because as the longer the silence the more they'll say usually the what how and why those usually lead they're open-ended and, and, and those yes. are good it's it's tough that the silence is a good point. It's hard sometimes to just sit there mm -hmm. and wait uh, instead of jumping in because it gets a little bit awkward. It right. seems like a lot longer in your mind than it is, but it it's does. best to just shut your mouth because eventually they're thinking, then they'll say something. Maybe they're hesitant about saying and they'll, they'll Some of, they'll some of Mike it. Wallace's greatest interviews, greatest gets, as they say, on the old 60 Minutes back in the 80s and 90s and late 70s, where he would ask a question, a hard question, he would cross his legs and cross his arms, <laughs> and the subject would sit there and they would just roll roll, roll, and tell the person. Usually they finally said something they wish they hadn't said, but it's the truth. you got to get to the truth, right? Before we get to our next guest in your segment, which is Above the Folds, we have to thank our title sponsor because none of this happens without New Leaf Produce Market. Your garden must be done for the year, hey? Yeah, I, 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 I got, there's this, a couple of pea pods. I actually ate one two days ago and it, was, it wasn't too bad. And also I finally uh, opened and have halfway through the cherry juice, which is unbelievable. Yeah, this, is, this one I haven't seen, the pure pear juice. You can get down there, check it out at New Leaf Produce Market. Butternut squash, hot right now, hot right now. Yeah. Uh, this juice, I had a chance to go to Merit, check out the commercial juicer, and you can see that video right now. Herman, it's a little cold for him. He's got locked jaw, so we can't speak right now. So we're going to take a tour. We're going to show you. We've got the commercial juicer here today. He pumps it into the collector, just like that. And then they go into the press right there, and they're washed a little bit. Pasteurized over here on the left. Dressed up as Herman over there. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Something weird in the air on Halloween. <laughs> Probably the best thing about this juice, though. No chemicals, no added sugar. This is the real deal, pure apple juice. Today we have Craig Thompson from the uh, Royal Canadian Legion Kamloops branch, past president and a man of jack of all trades. Uh, Craig is the guy we go to when we want to get information about the Legion, about things going on. This is the second straight year in which we're going to have a more muted Remembrance Day ceremony due to that darn pandemic. Yes. Although there's more going on than last year. Tell us about what's going to happen tomorrow, what we can and we cannot do. Well, it, it's going to be very similar to last year, uh, but we've got better numbers this year. We're allowed to have 100 people uh, at the ceremony tomorrow. So uh, we've, of course, brought in a few more people. We've, we're having more people on parade than we were allowed to last year. Uh, but it, it's going to be very similar to what we all remember from Riverside Park. Uh, it's, we're going to uh, have a cenotaph guard, which is the four... Um, people at the at, at the corners, corners of the yeah. of the cenotaph mm -hmm. there will be three rocky mountain rangers and one rcmp on this year then we'll march on the color party um and the color party is consisting of legion members um anavets um representatives from the seaforth highlanders and uh rcmp as well 
And then uh, we'll get into the the nuts and bolts of it, I guess. The the singing of O Canada, the last post, River yep. Valley, and this year uh, where we missed out last year. The jets are going to be right. in the air, oh, nice. and they'll be flying over at approximately 11.04 if we get our timings That's proper right. That's right. with them. How much do you miss the crowds? I love going to that ceremony, and part of it is I love the kind of collective silence and the collective aspect of it. So how much do you miss having it full bore like we used to? Well, I don't think that we miss the crowd so much as the crowd misses us. We, we're going to be celebrating Remembrance Day no matter what. It's being able to share it with the community and, and the general public. And those people who go to the storefronts and put the money, whether it's a quarter, a dollar, or $20, and grab a poppy, where does that money go? All poppy money donations are trust funds. They are in trust uh, by the Royal Canadian Legion. Now the funds from the poppy trust funds are used for veterans purposes and veterans families only does not go to running the local legion uh, it goes to uh, veteran care homes it goes to uh, veterans that uh, to get the a PTSD dog uh, if a veteran walks in off the street and talks to me and said look I, I'm a veteran but I'm a little down right now I need a pair of steel-toed boots and a bus pass to get to work he gets it. Speaking of veterans' needs, and, and, and it, there's never enough money ever for everything they need. And as successive governments, federal governments, have come under criticism for not doing enough, for trying to claw back stuff, and, or, or, or not taking care of veterans after they serve specifically. Now, we have uh, a newly elected MP, Frank Caputo. He's an opposition MP, uh, succeeding Kathy McLeod. And just yesterday, he was given the uh, critic's role of uh, Shadow Minister for Veterans Affairs. And he said in a statement, and then to Michael Potestio, a reporter, that he intends to hold the government's feet to fire to make sure that the veterans do not go without. What needs to be done to ensure that you need to do what you, you do with the poppy money as least as possible? Well, I think the biggest thing facing veterans right now with Veterans Affairs is the wait times. And I think uh, Frank... Uh, admitted that yesterday. Um, that's something that uh, Frank has, has gleaned from uh, talking with veterans during his, candid, uh, his uh, campaign. Uh, he, he's met with a number of veterans that I'm aware of. I've had chats with him both during the campaign and afterwards. And uh, he knows that the wait time is probably the biggest uh, issue. If Frank puts his mind to it, he will get it done. He's very conscientious that way. And um, the, this role, I, I know that uh, once he's up to speed on veterans' issues, that uh, it, it can't be any better for the veterans in this country. And it's great to have a, have a shadow cabinet minister here in, in Kamloops as well, where yeah. if we find little things about yeah. that, we can just, hey, yeah. Frank, by the way. <laughs> Hopefully he'll prosecute it well. Yes, very well. Uh, before we let you go, is there anything else you wanted to touch on as it relates to Remembrance Day or anything else about the Legion you want to talk about? No, just that, uh, you know, um, the Legion is a membership-driven organization across the country. Anyone can become a member of the Legion. You do not have to have military service. You do not have to have military service in your background. Uh, and it's a way that you can help. And we give away a lot of money in this community, uh, I think. Last year, we probably gave away about $100,000, uh, you know, in, in, and a lot of that right here in the community. And if I walk into the Legion on Lansdowne and I have a beer, does that money help the Legion? Oh, of course it does. And yeah, is it still that's, cheaper than most of the Can anyone just walk yeah. into uh, to the Legion <laughs> and have a beer, though, or is there, you have to be with, uh, how does that work? If, if, if a new person wants to walk in, we'll ask you to sign in, but we'll ask someone to vouch for you to, to, vouch for yeah. you to, yeah. to sign you in. But yeah, if you come in and just say, look, I'm considering joining the Legion, I'd like to just come in and uh, see what it's all about. Not a problem. We should go and have a, yeah, uh, have a pint there. You should, yes. You, you could buy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Hey, thanks a lot for your time. It was awesome. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Much okay. appreciated. Thank you. Family history in, in the war. I think you have some relatives or family history veterans. Yeah, it's kind of hazy, our, our history in the war. But uh, but my so my father was born in 39 and my mom was born in 30 or 37. My mom was born in 35. So they obviously didn't serve. But their, uh, their, uh, their fathers and uncles. Anyway, we had an uncle on my dad's side. Uh, his... His his uh, his his dad's uh, my grandfather's uh, brother Roddy Folds, 
and Ruddy. he was, yeah, and he and he uh, he was from uh, Saskatchewan, and he uh, he got shot down, mm -hmm. I think, over the English Channel. Uh, never never found, I don't think. Um, but they named a lake after him, uh, north of Prince. Prince uh, Prince Albert, where you spent oh, some time no at the way, newspaper yeah. there. So there, uh, so north somewhere north of Prince Albert, there's a lake called Folds Lake, named after Roddy Folds, who I don't know much about, but my sister's doing some research. Of course, befitting the Folds legacy, it's probably some swamp infested <laughs> with all mosquitoes and black flies, and no one can even get there. <laughs> Nevertheless, there's a there's some kind of pond, lake, probably stagnant water of northern Saskatchewan variety, named after uh, Roddy Foles, and that's kind of cool actually. Uh, my son Atticus and me, we were we went zoomed in on Google Earth one time, and he found it for me. Huh. And it's um it's in, it's in some pretty forbidden territory though, but it's yeah. there. I yeah. don't remember hearing anything about Folds Lake, so it probably yeah. was pretty pretty remote. Yeah, um, yeah. I did some research last night, and some of it I knew, some of it I didn't. My my great grandpa, whose name is Willie, just like my grandpa's name is, and my uh, name is William, and my dad's name is William. Anyway, my great grandpa Willie was in World War II, got shot through the knees, and had a limp for the rest of his life. My great Uncle Andrew was a conscientious objector, was sent to jail in Blackpool. He was religious and didn't believe in the war, so he was yep. jailed, got, uh, got TB, and was for the rest of his life had health issues. Uh, my grandpa Willie was um, 16, and he was conscripted into the Bevan Boys. They're all Scottish, this is all in Scotland, yep. and sent to the coal mines because there was a coal shortage. Yeah, so and they, well, you had to feed the war, right? Yeah, yep. yeah, so just kind of a... I, the conscientious objector one is interesting to me because I imagine he probably took a lot of heat from that even after the war, right? You would. I mean, there's, uh, you know, Kenny Rogers had a great song, Coward of the County. He was a conscientious objector. Um, Muhammad Ali didn't go to Vietnam because he was a conscientious objector and, and he, he got stripped of everything. So mm -hmm. it's it's very, it's, it's sometimes it's it's create, more courageous to do that sometimes to fight. I'm not saying that, you know, yeah. but but some people, uh, it, 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 could, it could affect your life forever. Sean Brady has a story in our newspaper today. He does, yeah, yeah. Uh, in our uh, November 10th, uh, off the front, inside, nice feature on a, uh, a, a younger veteran, a more contemporary veteran, uh, uh, Matt Mayer, who, uh, who happens to be uh, married to my niece uh, in Kamloops here. And he served in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And he talks about how it took a toll, PTSD. Uh, he had to rebuild his life coming back, uh, not from physical injuries, but from the from the from the. There's trauma. There's trauma there from what you see, who you interact with. He had to, you know, guard the Taliban. Uh, conflicting emotions about how I hate the, I hate these guys, but then you realize they're just farmers who are probably forced to fight against us. Mm -hmm. It's a really good story. It's it's very. It, it talks about the complex complexities of the issues and he talks about whether it was worth going there after everyone left in the Taliban's back so it's a good read. You can check that out in our paper also online and you can listen to this right now for some more from the Kamloops This Week Reporters and Last Week Clique. A few stories for me this week. Uh, first off just ahead of Remembrance Day a story on a veteran of Afghanistan and some other interesting missions. Uh, he shares with us how he feels about the war now that the Taliban is essentially retaking control of the country. Uh, also in the paper is a story of an unvaccinated Kamloops nurse who is now out of work and currently on the hunt for some space to reopen a controversial clinic. Uh, he seems to think they'll get shut down, but he's continuing anyway, so we'll see how that turns out. Finally, on Tuesday, there was such an outpouring of uh, grief and support over the passing of Drew McLean. Uh, he's been promoting music and comedy events here in Kamloops for more than a decade, uh, so check out what people are saying about him and the impact that he's had. It's, uh, it's quite the legacy. It's the time of the year where I am wearing both a sweater and also have a blanket at my desk. Yes, winter is coming and with that raises questions about what happens to the people who uh, live on the streets in Kamloops. The latest point in time count showed 206 people live without uh, a home, live on the streets in our community. And the city says that it's short about 90 shelter spaces right now heading into winter. 90. Um, BC Housing and the city are working towards securing additional shelter locations as uh, agencies say that shelters are over capacity and people are uh, sleeping in back alleys and in front of the Kamloops Curling Club downtown. Some announcements are expected imminently. Meanwhile, user groups uh, who would typically be skating at Memorial Arena are saying that they want that rink back, adding further pressure to the situation. There are 50 shelter spaces currently at Memorial Arena. And um, some, some hockey players are having to travel to communities like Logan Lake to play. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, interesting elements to this story, but um, some announcements expected in the near future. Hey guys, 
See that enormous white and orange building behind me there? So that's the new patient care tower that's going under construction up at Royal Island Hospital. And it's finally got a name. We know what it's gonna be called. It's gonna be called the Phil and Ginny Gallardi Tower. The family put up 15 million clams to get the naming rights there. And they're happy to do it, support the community that their family has such a long history in. The hospital foundation for this new building project, they're trying to raise 35, 35 million dollars to pay for the equipment that's gonna go in to the patient care tower. And obviously 15 million dollars is a lot of it. Oh, all right. Lastly, probably the most important thing I've been working on uh, this past week here. Uh, on Friday, I got to speak with the landlords of uh, missing woman Shannon White. Shannon disappeared sometime on November 1st. Um, on her way to work, seemingly. Uh, she lived on Bestwick Court. And uh, the landlords uh, said it was morning like any other. They say they saw her drive off, didn't see her technically get in to her vehicle. Uh, it's a 1997 Jeep TJ. Uh, that was found abandoned later on the next day, the next afternoon. Uh, but she seemingly left for work. They saw her that morning, and she's been missing for a little over a week now. It's uh, doing this is the November 9th right now. I'm recording this. Police are rightfully collecting a bunch of uh, surveillance footage, and they want people to continue to send in any footage that they can. They want to try and track Shannon's whereabouts. She's been missing for a while now, um, so uh, if anybody has any surveillance footage, if they can reach out to the RCMP at 250-828-3000, uh, I know they'd be much appreciated in, in trying to solve that case. Back to Marty and Chris in the studio. Jessica talked about the shelters in there. There's been an update since then. I think. Yes, we went to press yesterday on November 9th with a with a with a lengthy story from Jessica Wallace about the shelter situation in Kamloops and the need for shelters. And there's X number of, of shelter spaces were were missing. And right after we went to press, after she had spoken to the BC Housing spokesperson for two days, out comes a press release half an hour after we go to press, announcing that the city and the BC Housing have partnered in finding three new shelter spaces. Uh, the old Greyhound station up uh, up on uh, Notre Dame in, in, in Southgate. Um, Stuart Wood's going to be used again for, I think, 25 spaces. And they're going to build from the ground up a place on Kingston Avenue, which is just underneath the Halston Bridge there on the on the river walk there. And there, these three places are going to uh, be shelter spaces. for the, They're much needed for, for the homeless in town. Uh, the most crucial thing, uh, interesting thing for people would be the 50 or so people who are using Memorial Arena as a shelter right now, much to the chagrin of all the hockey groups, yeah. they're going to be moved up to the old Greyhouse, Greyhound bus, bus terminal, which is being leased by uh, BC Housing from the private owner. And then uh, hopefully in the new year, early new year, Memorial Arena will go back to being uh, an ice arena. And those other places will uh, will also be um, up and running. Um, it's going to take some time, though. I, I don't know why it took so long to get these leases going, because... We know, we knew last winter, we knew last summer that there was, there's an issue with homelessness. There's a, there, there's a need to house these or to you know, get, get them transitioning into housing. And maybe it's a lot, a lot of con um, negotiations with, get, with, with the landlords and everything, but it strikes me as funny that it's November, November 9th yesterday, it's cold outside, and they're just now announcing three new shelter spaces, one which won't even be built till next year or late later, and then two that won't be ready until well into the winter. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, it's a good thing, but it just strikes me as weird that it's taken so long to do something that we all knew was needed a year ago. Mm -hmm. But they're coming. Sean also talked about Drew McLean. Mike, is your mic up? Did you know Drew? Uh, yeah, I did know Drew. It's, uh, it's a sad story. He was a big uh, mover and shaker in Kamloops, did a ton of uh, events. Um, there was very little that he didn't have his uh, finger in, you know, whether it was uh, helping out at the Blue Grotto, the FE, tons and tons of things. Um, so, yeah, it's a shock, and, and uh, uh, it's going to leave a big hole and some big shoes for people to fill in Kamloops. 
Yeah, it was interesting to read how many people kind of reached out in, in Shandy's story talking about uh, basically what Mike just said about the hole that, that he leaves uh, in the city. We just had um, Aaron Shapotosky of, of the FE on as well. Yeah, he, uh, Aaron was on a couple of weeks ago talking about the FE Arts Collective, the former Stage House Theatre, and uh, Drew McLean was part of that endeavour. He was 49, he died suddenly on Monday, November 8th, and it's it's tragic. His, his daughter was talking about him online, and uh, the, the amount of tributes on, on online, and, and Sean's reached out to some people now, uh, talks about you know tells how how important he was to the arts arts community um, and uh, I, I I never met him but everybody knows Cameras Productions because mm -hmm. it was great it, it it produced a whole bunch of neat local events that we need we need arts as we talked about last week you can check that out online you can check Michael's story about the Gallardis and the in the hospital naming rights yep. online as well and that leads us into our next segment quite nicely the Gallardis you think about the Camelopes Blazers, Blazers yep. they're red hot and let's get to our next guest Matthew Seminoff uh, of the Camelopes Blazers joins us in last week this week <laughs> Something special brewing right now in Kamloops. That's Matthew Seminoff and Caden Bank here, just a couple of these young hotshot forwards. It's an embarrassment of riches right now for Sean Cluston and, and the Blazers, and they're just red it hot. It really is. Yeah, they're what, 12 and 1 right now. They're, uh, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're taping this on, uh, on the 10th, and they're going into Kelowna, the only team to beat them this year in, in the Lake City. And the team looks hot. The team look, in fact, I think today they just moved up to number three. Uh, that's amazing. From the three, you know, there's 60 teams in the country, and, yeah. and, and they're in the top five, which is something else. And they've got the WHL Goalie of the Week in Dylan Garand. He's on the CHL Team of the Week. And they've got Matthew Seminoff, who we're going to bring in right now. I want to ask you about where you're from, because if you look at Elite Prospects, it says you're from Leesburg, Virginia. I mean, what's, what's that? Were you born there and then you moved away? What's your history there? Yeah, I was actually born in, in uh, Leesburg, Virginia. Uh, I moved back to uh, Vancouver, where my dad's from. I moved to Port Moody when I was about six or seven. And then uh, probably six or seven years ago, I moved to Coquitlam, uh, still in Vancouver area there. Um, Last three years, I've uh, been living in Kamloops and playing with the Blazers. I think you have more family connections in this town, don't you, in Kamloops? Yeah, I got uh, my aunt lives here. Actually, she lives just over in Westside. Um, so it's good to have some family here. I got a couple distant uncles that live here and aunts. So it's it's pretty nice to, to get some fans, though, and uh, uh, some family here. It made things a lot easier, especially my in my rookie year. I think also hole four at the Kamloops Golf and Country Club, there is a Verna Seminoff. Mm -hmm. Is that your great aunt or who, who's, who's uh, that? Yeah, that's my great grandma. Great -grandma. Um, she was a big golfer and um, a big part of that, that, that club. So uh, to see that, and I was just golfing there for the first time this summer actually. So uh, to see that bench and uh, kind of see that little monument for, that, for her, it was, uh, it was pretty special. So you're a prospect for the upcoming draft. You are third in team scoring, but you almost kind of fly under the radar on this team with all the talent that's there. Do you kind of feel sometimes like you fly under the radar? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. I mean, we, you know, we got we got a lot of talented players, and uh, that's what makes our team so good. I think we have we have so much depth and so many guys that can contribute. Uh, I wouldn't feel I I ever look for that or crave that, uh, just because we have so many good guys and. Everyone's contributing on all fronts. You have a game tonight against the Rockets. I want to ask you about the brawl. You were part of that brawl. You were in a tilt that night. Take me back to that night and how crazy it was. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I, I heard a lot of stories about the rivalry, and we played them a lot that year. Um, you know, it, was getting, it was getting to that time of the year in playoffs. We were coming up, so uh, tensions were pretty high. Um, I didn't really, no one really thought it was going to happen or there was any indication that there was going to be a lot of fights that night. Um, once it kind of started happening, that one shift where I think, I think everybody, everybody went at the same time. And then the <laughs> you goalie, were 16, so. were you 16 at that time? Yeah, I was 16. I was pretty nervous on the bench, but, uh, it was, um, you know, I saw everyone else going and, you know, I kind of thought this is kind of a good time to just get it out of the way. And, you know, and I think that was a big, a big part of, you know, our team just shows how tight we were and uh, we weren't going to back down from anybody. We were, we were all battling for each other. So I think we got a, a similar, similar type of group this year that, you know, we're willing to go to war with, uh, with anybody out there. 
The last one for me. What's the ceiling for the Blazers this season? We can go all the way. Um, that's the goal for any season, but uh, we know that if we're playing, if we're playing our game, we're playing good. Uh, it's going to be tough for a team to beat us uh, four times. So that's a long ways away, but um, you know that's the end goal for us. And we have our, our uh, we have our sights set high, so we're pretty excited to, to just keep going in the season. Here. All right, thanks a lot for joining us. Appreciate it. No worries. Thank you guys. Thanks. Good luck tonight. Thoughts on the interview? Yeah, he seems like a nice kid. He's, he's like uh, just a nice, uh, modest kid. It's interesting that he's, he's born in Leesburg. That's a, that's a, that's a big uh, Civil War town. Uh, it changed hands 150 times during the War of 1861 to 65. And there's a big battle there called Battle of Balls Bluff. Uh, where uh, where uh, Beauregard beat McLennan. It was a great south versus up north thing. But it's neat that he's from there because it's such a historic place. Mm. Anyway, that's what I think was cool. Also, I think it's really, really neat. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword. The East doesn't play the West this year, the Eastern Conference, so we don't get to see Bedard and, you know, yeah. we don't get to see Winnipeg, which I think is still number one in the country. But imagine, it's, it's kind of cool, though, because it's like the old... You know the old baseball as God intended it, where the AL doesn't meet the NL until <laughs> yeah. until the World Series. So, in that way, it's going to be really neat if Kamloops can emerge from the West and say, Winnipeg from the East. They never play each other all season, and then you got the best meeting each other, and you never know what's going to happen. And I think that's more exciting. In the here and now, it's not great for the fans because you'd like to see some yes. of those teams. Right. You can see the Giants, who are supposed to be the Blazers' probably number one rivals in the BC Division. They're playing twice this weekend: Friday night in Kamloops. Saturday in Langley. Didn't the Giants just lose to Prince George? The Giants lost to PG last yeah. night, one nothing. So yeah. that's 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 tough for them. Yep. Hockey, not the only game in town. TRU Wolfpack Volleyball, both their teams are home this weekend. And we're going to catch up with them right now in the Tattle of Hastings. This is one of the great examples of a team that got hosed because of the pandemic. 2019-2020 was the best year in the program history for the Wolfpack women's volleyball team. And they were supposed to peak the next year, which turned out to be the pandemic year. After that, they had seven girls that graduated, seven ladies that graduated. So that team was decimated. And fourth in the conference, best finish ever. They reached the U Sports top 10 for the first time ever. And then they couldn't see building for years, they couldn't see it all come to fruition. Yes. Meanwhile, you've got the men's Wolfpack volleyball team under Pat Henley, the longest tenured and probably the most successful coach. They've had some tough years. They had a great team in that year, but they didn't quite reach potential. And then last year, they had these surprise transfers, these shock transfers, three of their one of their best prospects and two of their best players, the Canada West Rookie of the Year, they just left the school, surprised uh, everybody, including Pat Henley. Mm -hmm. And uh, I caught up with both of those teams at the gym this past week. I'm more disappointed for the girls that aren't coming back to play and see what they could have done. Uh, I mean, I'll coach this year, but they're not going to play this year. Um, so it, it's, it is too bad for that group. I mean, we built that group and, and then they never got to see what they could do kind of in their, in their last year. Um, but I mean, that was the same for everybody. It wasn't losing a, a volleyball season wasn't the worst thing happening in the world. So um, it, although it's disappointing, we I think we moved on quickly and, and we have a, a new group here that we're, we're trying to build. I know there's going to be struggles. I know there's going to be ups and downs, uh, but I also know we're going to grind and compete and learn how to survive in this league. You are interesting because you kind of helped one group from through a rebuild to this great team yeah. that you didn't get to see the end of it. I mean, how, yeah. how frustrating was that part of it? Yeah, I think we built something very strong and to not see like the reward of that group really pay off in the competitive setting was frustrating, but that doesn't really take away from like the legacy they left here um, and the things that we still carry from that group. So in a sense, it's frustrating, but we also took a lot of good from that and are kind of integrating it into this group um, and this environment here. So trying to take the positives from it, I guess. I think Chad does a good job at recruiting a similar type of strong, um, hardworking, respectful, good teammate kind of player. Um, so it's like a new generation of those that have already come and gone. No culture issues here. No, <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah, we're, uh, you know, we're preseason ranked 12th. Uh, I'm not gonna argue that with anyone, but uh, you know, the goal the goal is to fight for playoffs. And with what happened last year, the, the guys that left, did it spark a full rebuild, that, that happening? Oh, I mean, I mean we, we would have been a rebuild if they stayed. So yeah, we're, you know, we're hundred percent rebuild. And the message to the guys is, you know, we've been top five, five times in Canada West and bottom of the league three times in Canada West. So 
we've had to rebuild before we're certainly in a rebuild now i'm kind of used to this because uh when i was at olds there was something similar we had like pretty much restarting a whole new team like rebranding redoing the whole team culture and everything changing directions making changes and starting off brand new so here i get the same feeling that we're doing and it's like really good because i can really contribute and help how, how jacked up are you oh i'm beyond punk man ever since i was playing like club in like 16 new days i always wanted to play at the highest level of volleyball i possibly could and like from going to college i was a, a big huge step for me and i was super excited for that and that environment was crazy but coming to sport and playing the like top best of the best and all the teams of canada west and east and it's amazing, especially to be finally back playing real games with live spectators. Like, it's like, honestly, one of my dreams come true. The home openers are this weekend. We've got the women at 5 o'clock on Friday, the men at 6.45. They both play the UBC Okanagan Heat. They're both 2-0. and The Wolfpack are both 0-2. They got shellacked by the defending Canada West champions, the Trinity Western Spartans powerhouse in Langley. So it's private, a it's private a school, so they can, you know, they, they have an unfair advantage there. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a total rebuild for the Wolfpack. It is. That's it for the show. Thoughts today in general on the show? Uh, good show. Remembrance Day is always nice to have someone from uh, from the Legion or uh, to speak about why it's important. I know it's every year people talk about it, and 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 as we get farther and farther and further and further from the uh, from the conflicts, uh, people might forget about it. The young people, especially. So it's good to have Craig and others to remind us, you know, why it's important and why you should take a moment tomorrow. Maybe don't go shopping. Maybe sit home and think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why we miss that ceremony. I love, mm -hmm. I love that, it's great. that ceremony. Yeah, it's great. I took my kids there when they were young all the time. Yep. Thanks again to Herman Hothi and New Leaf Produce Market. Get on down there. Check out their juice. Next week, uh, I'm filming a commercial for Cold Control Mechanical. We've got a new sponsor coming on board. Contact me, klw at camlosisweek.com, if you'd like to sponsor. We always thank Mike and Bonnie, always, and uh, Lee's Music in the Bowels for the work they, they do. And the engineer. What's the engineer's name again? Great. Greg? Yeah. Greg as well. Yeah. Greg? Greg. Greg. The new guy, Greg. So Greg. thanks to everybody involved. Scott Finley and the Grand Ones. For Chris, I'm Marty. We'll see you last week. Last week.